Legends. I'm one of the curators at the gallery here, and I've been working on the Ron Muick exhibition. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you. You're the first people that have been in here tonight to see the show. Um, and just before I introduce everyone, just a couple of practical things. Um, we decided not to use microphones because it was a bit complicated to walk around. So if you can't hear us or if our voices drop a bit, do shout up and let us know. Um, we also have some chairs if anyone gets tired and wants to sit down. Uh, but the idea is that we are going to sort of try and walk around the exhibition a little bit. So I'm going to introduce um, our speakers tonight. We're very pleased to have two people who know Ron Ruick very well. Um, Anthony Doffe, who is the ex officio curator of Artist Rooms and whose gallery represented Ron Ruick for many years. Still do, actually, don't you? <laughs> and uh, Charlie Clark, who is Ron Ruick's senior technician who's been working with Ron Ruick for many years um, on his work. Um, In fact, um, Ron Ruick and Charlie Clark was. When Ron Muick wakes up in the morning, he calls Charles and says, can I get up? Can I get up and make some sculpture? And Charlie says, away you go. <laughs> Anyhow, Charlie is really responsible for shows all over the world um, for the last 10 or 15 years of Ron Muick. And at the moment, there's a fantastic retrospective uh, for a Fondation Castle in Paris at the moment, with long, long lines of people outside, and I think we've had 125,000 people in a couple of months. Great success. Uh, some, of, some of those sculptures are in this show, and there are some more in the show that aren't in Paris. So maybe I can start by asking you both of you, um, maybe I'll start with you actually, Charlie, about how you first um, came across one's work and maybe a little bit of background about him as an artist. Sure. Well, I first came across Ron's work when the rest of the world did, um, which was at about the time of the Sensation Exhibition, not all before that, when that collection was starting to be put together, which is about 1997 to 1998, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came a whole group of artists, uh, uh, but uh, and new work was being discovered. But uh, everybody in, in that I knew it immediately thought when they saw this extraordinary sculpture of Ron Munich that it was something special, and that proved to be the case when the exhibition Sensation opened, and, and uh, you know everybody seemed to think that Dead Dad, which was a sculpture that showed, and also they showed, I think, Pinocchio and the mask. First mask. Mask and the show of the flame. Oh, the angel, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I met Ron first at that time. I was worked, working as a technician and I worked on that exhibition, uh, which involved helping Ron a little bit. Um, Excuse me. I'm sure you know this show. It's called Sensation. It was at the Royal Academy and it, it was very controversial and it was a sort of it, it was the first big show of all the young British artists. And everybody had heard about Damien Hurst and Sarah Lucas and all these girls and boys. But there was one Australian born artist that nobody had ever heard of, and that was Ron Muir. And um, particularly, he'd done a, a sort of half life size sculpture called Dead Dad of his father, naked, dead. Extremely moving, slightly shocking, and unforgettable. And that sculpture. I think it's true to say Charlie mm. became world famous from then right up to the moment where Wolverhampton had their own view of it. So can I ask you the same question then, Anthony, about how you first met? Him? Same thing. Yeah. No difference. Yeah. I, I follow in his footsteps all yeah. the time. <laughs> I think you might be there first. <laughs> And um, so we made friends with Ron and said, um, uh, in this world of contemporary art, it's good to have a gallery to work with and who can represent you, otherwise you have all these people coming and knocking on your door and uh, breaking down the window in the back laboratory and trying to steal things. Mm -hmm. And so we, we uh, organised shows with him and started working with him with museums around the world. 
And um, here's somebody who actually in their life have made uh, uh, 35 sculptures, okay? And there are five sculptures in this show. So there's a sizable part of his earth just in this exhibition. He's somebody who is perfectionist, um, who is a loner, extremely shy. Um, he wasn't so shy. You see the big sculpture next door, the, sh the wild man. See how shy he is. That's how shy Ron is, roughly speaking. <laughs> he came for the installation to help us um, place the things. But um, he has a horror of um, having his hand shaken and uh, his back patter than his photograph taken. Um, anyhow, what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, and, and then uh, in 2001 we closed the gallery and started to do this, uh, um, this big project called Artist Rooms across the country and all the artists went off to Timothy Taylor or the Bibliothecian Gallery or other distinguished places and we shook them goodbye, gave them a cup of tea, back them back and um, then we said we found there was this one Australian artist who didn't want to go and said, hey, um, he was never really an issue, was it? He, 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 you never asked him to leave and he never asked him to leave. So Charlie and I have been looking after him ever since, roughly speaking. And, uh, it's very interesting, um, Chris Gandler from Artist Rooms here, who was in charge of education, said to me this evening how strong youth was, which is the most recent work in the show. And here is somebody who makes one sculpture at a time, and pretty much everyone is a masterpiece. That's an incredible thing. And, um, if, if you think of, if you think of a <coughs> boy in Melbourne with very poor German parents, his father is a house painter, often out of work, and the children working in a garage making dolls and marionettes to sell in the market, so that there's some money for Supper. He was in Melbourne, which I'm sure some of you know is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. He was 17 years old when he discovered they were living by the sea. I think if you think of that, you realize how tough this childhood was. Literally making sculptures literally having to sell them to survive and learning to be this extraordinary perfectionist. Maybe it's good just to perhaps talk a little bit about this work that we've got here on the left, which is called Ghosts and it's on loan from the Tate. And this is, uh, I think I'm right in saying this is the earliest work in the exhibition. Yes, it is. And um, maybe this is a good work to look at in reference to the question about what it is that people are so fascinated by when they look at Ron Lewis's work. What, you know, what is it that we see as <coughs> viewers? How we interact with it? And I, I made a few notes on the train and uh, about each of the sculpture. I just read, read them. They're, they're random notes. They aren't supposed to uh, Ghost is someone who is changing from one state to another. Like a calf or a foal just born, or a cicada, or a butterfly pupiting out of a chrysalis, she has all legs slightly wobbly and surprised at herself. Adolescence is, as we all know, neither one thing nor another. Changing states are a frequent subject for Newark. So much feeling 
and no experience of managing it. Getting older is the only cure for growing up, said Jane Campion. Ghost haunts life, but does not yet feel that she is living it. I suppose with the works, um, with a lot of Ron's work, um, there seems to be some sort of narrative behind it, or you certainly want to know the stories behind it, and you're trying to look for stories, but maybe that's not so important. Um, maybe it's about what we as viewers bring to the work. I think it's interesting that Ron always leaves it ambiguous. There's no prescribed uh, thing that you should feel or person that, that this sculpture is. He never tells, I mean, he's never, he's not here to tell us, he's got nothing he wants to tell us about the sculpture other than what we can see. And that's always the case with him, and I suppose that's why he's not here now and we are, we can't speak for him, but, you know, we can have our own reactions. But he, there is always that ambiguity that if there is a narrative, it's your own, which, you know, doesn't mean you have the wrong narrative, if that's the right narrative, it's your own your own reaction to the sculpture. That's what it's there for, in a way. It's not to tell you something, but for you to have your own reaction. And, and um, there's, a, there's some sort of parallel in her shyness with the wild man next door, I think. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we could look at this work over here, just for mother and child. <coughs> um, because this is from the period when one had residency at the uh, National Gallery. Is there something about the residency that one had at the National Gallery? Yeah, I think he was at the National Gallery two or I think even three years. And um, everybody working there really loved him. And I think it was a great experience for him. Now, this is somebody who never went to art school, okay? So, I mean, this is somebody who comes from nowhere and totally invented himself. So maybe his art school was after he made these sculptures, Dead Dad and um, Mask One and the little boy Angus sitting on a stool, he goes to the National Gallery, becomes the artist in residence, and I think that he was able to mature while he was there. Do you think that's true? I think so. I think so. It's probably more of an encounter with, with you know, fine art than he probably ever had before. That's right. And um, I think that, um, oh, I'll tell you what I wrote down. Very little. <laughs> the, pro <laughs> the protagonists are both exhausted and trying to come to, to terms with their change of state. And change of state is quite a constant theme in sculptures. One has become two and they can see each other. How surprised are they? And then I was very interested in the subject. Um, this is a subject which is in everybody's thoughts because of the royal birth about to happen probably during the time when we're walking around. <laughs> sure. But the idea, um, I was interested, um, Marguerite, in the idea of birth without violence. And um, I was interested in the work of Michel Odon, Le Boyer, which I'm sure some of you know. My um, daughter-in-law, who's Japanese, has just given birth to a little boy, and she did it at home with a mid midwife. She didn't go to hospital. And I'm sure you all know all the different ways you can be born. <coughs> People of my age normally were born always in hospitals. Their mother was given an epidural, which is one hell of a lot of anaesthetic, which of course uh, goes straight to the child. 
The child is born often with forceps, and the moment that the child comes out, the cord is cut. The child is cut, turned upside down, and spanked. Uh, does anybody, did anybody else have that experience apart from me? <laughs> Don't be shy. Is there anybody in the room that had that experience? <laughs> That's because I'm old. Anyhow, this baby looks like he's having a, a pretty good time, all things considered. John. <laughs> <laughs> But it's interesting that birth should be fashion as well. The way you're born is to do with your date, to do with the date that you're born. Is that not true? I'm not sure. Yes. It's not that in what respect? They don't cut the cord immediately. You aren't hit so that you breathe. Yeah. You know, uh, women aren't always given epidural. Yeah. So you mean sort of sharing their stories and having the right kind of birth or the wrong kind of birth or... I, I, think, it, I, I think the idea, for example, um, nowadays is that the mother bonds with the baby and um, has the baby on her tummy and then introduces her breast to it. Um, used to be the cord was cut the baby's made to cry, it's taken away and washed and sort of bound in something and probably put into, you know, a cot next door. So that bonding doesn't actually happen. I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the way that, that um, what's happening here isn't about an immediate bond, you know, an immediate paternal love, it's kind of almost shock on their faces, isn't it? And, um, in that Absolutely. respect, it's very different from, you know, just thinking about when one was at the National Gallery and he would have been looking at all those images of Madonna and Child and, you know, they, they don't look like that, do they? They're, he you know, always used to say that. He said all the great paintings of uh, um, Madonna's and, um, and uh, uh, Child, uh, the baby doesn't look remotely like that, not like a real child. Interesting though that he, I mean, I think various artists have done a residency at the National Gallery and most of them seem to say that, that what's fascinating about being there is being able to walk through the galleries at 8 o'clock in the morning before it's open and there's just somebody cleaning the floor and there are crowds of, yeah. of people and then it's a time that you can be intimate with those works of art in a way which is much harder um, during peak times um, but a lot of artists who work there use that as a time to draw from a particular painting you know, maybe they make paintings or drawings which are transcriptions of a particular painting. You know, but Ron's reaction to that is not, you know, to make the, the baby that you see in a particular painting, but actually to draw from the experience of what he sees in those paintings and then refer that directly back to, you know, to life, to, to the real world. And to actually to make sculptures which are, you know, in, not influenced so much by the paintings that you saw at the National but influenced by the way those paintings had influenced him. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yes, yes. So it's referred directly back to him. Yeah. You know, it's not a separate part of, of his work, things that were just made in response to, mm -hmm. to that. It's obviously something that, you know, affected him and that was carried forward. And do you think, I mean, maybe this is a good opportunity to ask you about the subject matter, um, because it strikes me that he's almost sometimes subliminally um, affected by subjects rather than actively going out and seeking subject matter. Um, what, what would you say about that? Um, how does he decide what to make next? <laughs> well, um, I don't know and I don't think he probably knows either. You know, I think, I, I don't think there's a list of things that he wants to make. I mean, and all this sculptures are actually very, very different. It's not a, there's, there's no series. You know, where each one you know progresses very slightly and the next one's very slightly different and it grows and each of his things are very separate, they're very sort of fully realized and they're complete in themselves. If if all the other sculptures weren't if this was all we had, and it was only one, that, that would it would be complete. 
without the others. Um, I think somehow those ideas come. I don't know how to decide what what to make. I, I guess they're just there and, and they have to be made. Really. Is there any interesting sculpture um, in, in relation to the uh, spooning couple next door? Yeah. Which is um, to do with love or lack of love, which is the first way of, you know, the first glimmer of paper making a baby, isn't it? If you were mm. And um, it, it, it's pretty unusual for him to do two figures. Um, and one thing you can say about this, this, this ancient um, subject matter of mother and child, he's approached it from a completely different way from ever, any other um, figure in the history of art, and produced something that is, that is um, deeply moving, somewhat shocking, and extremely memorable. We, we've just been asked a question, um, which is something that we were going to touch on, which I think is quite important, which is about how they made. So Charlie, I'm going to ask you yeah. if you could say something about the process that Ron uses when he makes the sculptures. Yeah, so everything that Ron makes is, is uh, first sculpted in, in mm -hmm. clay, and that's where all these details come from. Um, is by actually sculpting a very traditional way with a lump of clay. Um, so he starts usually with a, making small sketches and, and maquettes to <coughs> try to visualise, try to, to make the first manifestation of it. Look at the one next door, you'll find that it's, it's made, it's, it's, it's sculpted so you can see it with all the hair and the whatever. The, any clothes has no clothes, but if they have clothes, they're, they're all sculpted in. So that is what the sculpture will be. But when it comes to be sculpted in the clay to be cast, um, obviously that has to be done without hair, without garments, without anything else, without eyes, which is quite hard to, uh, quite sort of difficult mental leap to make. And I think you'll know that when you see them, even sort of this finished sculpted clay in the studio, it looks quite weird and spooky sometimes. Um, it's hard to imagine with the eyes in and the, the hairs on it and you think, what on earth is this thing? And it, but somehow Ron has this in his mind, what it will be like when it's, when it's finished. Ah, so obviously this one was quite a lump of clay in the studio, in the studio but it was a solid lump of clay with wires, <coughs> scaffolding poles and so on inside and the studio floor had been propped up from underneath because it was creaking a lot and we had to bolt it to the ceiling because it was going to fall over. Um, uh, but sculpted and fully realised in, in clay, all the, the pinnacles on its back and uh, every wrinkle and every crease, it's sculpted into the clay. It's quite an effort to keep that clay wet long enough that it doesn't dry out um, it, until the details are finished. Um, somehow he's, he, he's so good at that, but, uh, but so perfectionist that you, know, you might have a fully finished foot that's got every wrinkle of detail is perfect, but if he decides it's in the wrong place, it all gets squashed up and, and done again. It's not a sort of miracle of being able to conjure it up, because it displays all the time that if it's something's not quite right, you can squash it all back down and make it all up exactly the same, you know, you know it, with all those details again. Just something he's extremely good at, which is why we're here. Uh, but then, obviously, that clay is, is uh, has to be uh, moulded, and mould is made, and then the sculpture is, is cast out, minus hair and anything else. Um, uh, and this, the colour of the sculpture is always in the substance. It's not <coughs> painted on afterwards, and that's one of the things that really, really makes them sort of feel lifelike in a way is that the surface is slightly translucent, and the colour is cast into the surface. So the light actually passes into the sculpture and comes out again. I think that's what makes them much more, you know, so much more lifelike in a way than, it, you know, if, if they were cast solid and then it was all painted on afterwards. And Charlie, mm. if you think of this big sculpture yep. uh, in Ron's somewhat tiny studio, from the decision to make it, 
to it looking like that? How many months or to looking like this? Yeah. How 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 long do you think that would take? Right. Well, I think we've already we've already sort of decided that probably we're lucky if you get two sculptures a year. Yes. Uh, and he does work very long days most days of the year. Um, uh, uh, but despite being a, a perfectionist himself, there are certain tasks that can be done by assistants. Um, uh, the making of hair is one of those. Uh, <laughs> hair making is a long process, and uh, anybody working in the studio groans when it's hair making time because it means that for two or three weeks they do nothing but take nylon line, like a fishing line, and they sand it down because it's too shiny, and then they paint it a colour, and then they curl each one individually by <laughs> wrapping them around a the rod of the right thickness, and if it's wrong, it has to be done again, and then some heat is applied and they come out curled, and then each one's curled. Not to mention the hair for every hair there, and the hole is drilled, and, and uh, each hair is put a little bit blue and put in. Um, and he's also a great perfectionist about the distribution of hairs. Because if you start, if you start on one leg and somebody else starts on the other leg, and they're a little bit too close together, that's, that doesn't work at all. And uh, with these uh, 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 fiberglass resin sculptures, once you drill the hole, that's it, you're done. So if you've done it wrong, you can't take it out and do it again. Um, so Can you say something about the hair on Wild Man's head? Because I was quite fascinated when you were telling me earlier on about that. Because I think you said it's horse hair. Well, that is horse hair. Yeah, that comes from a horse's tail, uh, actually. The, the, the other hairs are made of uh, nylon line, which is sort of easier to manipulate. I mean, it's hard to, well, there's a lot to do to it to make it hair, but it does, uh, it, it does. The, the beauty of it is that once you've made it like that, it stays like that. Hair, the, um, the hair on the head is made of horses, it is horses, so it is hair, so it does behave like hair. Uh, although it takes an awful lot of hairspray to make it stay <laughs> <laughs> in, yeah, in that position. Um, but even the, even the sourcing of horses' hair is not easy. It comes in a variety of different colours and it's natural in, in colour, but uh, it involves sourcing for a lot of horses to find the right, <laughs> the right sort. So can I ask you, Anthony, about um, what your, if you have any thoughts on this sculpture? Oh, and, um, what I wrote down was, why is Wild Man sitting on a kind of Edwardian lab stool made by Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> is he in a laboratory situation? Has he been captured in the wild and brought back to civilization to be observed by people without kindness or imagination? That is excluding the people in this room. He is very clean and his hair is not unkempt. Has he been in this position of exposure for some time? What does exposure mean in this context? Is he being interrogated? In what language? Is this a pleasant experience for him? Every man is a wild man, but he or she disguises their wildness by habits and manners and clothes. He shaves cuts his hair and beard according to fashion. He rarely exposes this nude, nude state except in private. Nakedness, Adam and Eve before and after the fall, the nakedness of shamelessness after his figures, states of grace, man and society. Man hides behind society, even to the Nazis, is afraid to be alone in his wild state but he's empowered by society to do things that he know, knows are wrong. Adam and Eve would not have eaten the apple if they'd been on their own. Wild man is embarrassed by being out of place, by being out of size, and being naked in a clothed environment. Perhaps he's frightened of the clothed visitors to the museum who have found some freedom in the protection of their clothes and in their society's customs. Gulliver is a museum like a zoo. Is a zoo a good thing? The artist as outsider. Is he closer to the wild man than the museum visitor? I'm sure we all see very different things in each of the sculptures. 
And I mean, I think the thing, when I first started to think about this exhibition and how to put the work together, it seemed like there were two strands coming out. One was about um, mythology and folklore, and one was about stages of life. And then as I sort of did more, spent more time looking at the works, I realised that it wasn't possible really to separate them in that way, that they're, all of the works are about so many different things, and there's such a lot of overlap, really, between them. They make you feel somehow shy about yourself, the sculptures. If you look at uh, um, photographs of Diane Arbus, they bring out strong feelings in you. Not just about the person in the photograph, but about yourself. <coughs> and I think that the power of Ron's works is that power. They make you ask questions which are not always easy, and not always comfortable about yourself. This figure uh, brings to mind those feelings that you sometimes have if you have to go into a room full of people you don't know, <coughs> or you feel you've put your foot in it, or you feel out of place because you're too young or too old or too silly or <coughs> whatever it is. I think that all those states of mind are suggested by Ron sculptures and their states of mind which we all have and we all experience but very privately inside ourselves and we very often don't share these sculptures to the sharing for us and I think a lot of that power uh, lies in that direction. Shall we look at the sculpture over here called the Moving Couple? Yeah. Who here can tell us what's going on between the couple? Sorry? Yeah, that's an interesting um, that's an interesting observation. And um, it feels like, as you suggested, it's after making love, or it feels like we can't make love, <coughs> one or the other. In either case, the, the figures that seem to be sunk into their own thoughts at this moment, don't they? Mm -hmm. They're very close, but they aren't looking into each other's eyes. And it, it's, um, it's, you know, the sharing <coughs> either can't take place or has taken place, and now they're alone with themselves. That's, that's what it feels like, exactly. And that's why it's, it's that very, very private, those very private thoughts which I was talking about in terms of wild man to do with shyness and embarrassment and those things. Marguerite, is that true? Yeah, I think that they're obviously, they're close, but they both look quite troubled as well. There's a right. lost in their inner thoughts, aren't yeah. they? And now, I do know about this sculpture, and you'll um, uh, be able to remember this, Charlie, that Ron, for years, said, I'm making a sculpture called Spooning Couple, and then, most unlikely, unlike him, he had people pose in that position. And he worked on it for ages, and uh, then he made something, and then he didn't like it, and then he destroyed it, and then he thought he'd made it, and then he destroyed it again. It was, uh, I think the subject matter is so tough. Uh, and I think also he was, he was waiting for a point when the relationship, because this is clearly a sort of, you know, it's a more equal relationship than the, the uh, mother and child, or anything yes. the others, so that the when the relationship somehow became real, became believable, became awkward, became, you know, something that you couldn't ignore in the room. Uh, and I know that he, he sculpted these in, in many positions, but there was a moment when he just moved the man's arm off. That's the right. Yeah, that's and, right. And he just moved it. And then at that moment, suddenly, you know, I mean, you almost had to look away. But it, it was... It was embarrassing. It was all, I mean, there, yes. there was a relationship in the room, you know, as if I, you and I had just had an argument and, you know, everybody yes. would be able to know that yeah. here. And, and at that moment, it, 
it, it became, that, of course, then it took months and months to actually mm -hmm. finish making it, but that was the moment for him when it, the relationship became real. Can I just ask at what stage you decided to do it that scale? Because I think that really has mm. such a lot to it. I think, I think <coughs> right from the beginning, the idea. I think the scale is something that... Um, I, 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 I feel with Ron that he sees um, the sculpture very clearly in his mind's eye. My, my guess is that uh, in every day it becomes clearer and clearer exactly how the sculpture should be. And um, by following religiously that sort of picture that he has in his mind, that's how the work comes about. I think that um, both these, the, these, both these figures are based on people that he knows, but I, I very much doubt if they modelled for it. Then, um, I think it's the other way around, actually. <laughs> Tell me. No, I think they modelled for it, for the anatomy and the rest, yes. but it's not them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if, if it is them, then that doesn't matter to us, because we don't know them. And yet, the power of it is it that we do know them, because in some way it's ours. And we know that moment, either literally or we can imagine it. And, you know, it, it, um, this is not a moment actually of joy, is it? It's a moment of, like so many other bronze moments, of slight introspection, isn't it? And uh, um, maybe even awkwardness. It feels, in a way, it, it's quite a tense sculpture, right. isn't That's it? Right. Because it is an imperfect relationship and yeah. um, you know you can see that, that they're both got things on their mind and they're thinking things through and it's that time at night that often that's right. what you do isn't it? You see. Yes. And yeah. I think you're so right. right. <laughs> yeah you're right about. The, um, and they're two people who know each other extremely well aren't yeah. they? I mean you know uh, how old are they? They're in the mid thirties, late thirties, mm -hmm. something like that. I'm holding this scale, just picking up on that comment just now, because it seems in this show at least, things are either small scale or huge, and we react very differently um, to that. Do you think so? I'll tell you what I always think. I always think that the, the moment you look at the sculpture, you forget about the scale entirely. I don't feel much about that. I always want to hold it. It's, yeah. it's the scale that makes you want to embrace it. And I think, but don't you think that that's, that's a good thing to feel with this sculpture? Yeah, but, but I couldn't feel much about this. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to sit on it and move forward. You didn't really, didn't you? <laughs> Shall we move around to look at yeah. this final sculpture in the room, which is called You? And maybe you could share with us, Auntie, your thoughts on this. Just, just what I wrote there. Um, I wrote down there's a sense of wonder in the figure of the boy. Wonder implies both the questions why and how. Implying both interrogation and the moment of getting it once the force of it is wonder is up there. Doubting Thomas when Christ invited him to put his hand into the room in the side of the crucifixion is a biblical example of what this figure of Luke is experiencing. Something many of us recognise when as children we find we're facing a potentially life threatening situation. What action should we take? It doesn't hurt too much yet, but a little later will we die. Again, a potential change of states, yet violence and potential death seem very awkward. Nothing changes, life goes on. Maybe I'll ask you both this question, but where, where do you think this particular work sits in terms of sort of themes or subjects that Rob's explored in his work? Uh, well, he made this 
this sculpture with uh, in sort of, I mean, I don't think he, he, he picks up a theme for a group of sculptures, but along with this sculpture happens to come, and if you look at the books you can put across uh, the hall, you can see um, a, a sculpture called Drift, which is a, a man on a line of a on a swing, who is uh, attached to the wall, you know, and so it's a sort of crucifix uh, form. And another sculpture called Still Life, which is a roughly human being sized chicken, flat and hanging upside down. Um, and uh, it's very easy to see a sort of religious connotation in all of those sculptures. I don't think, you know, necessarily when you look at each one, that is something which is enforced um, or prescribed by the artist, but even that's one side of them, but that is, uh, I think that's there in all of them. Um, and it's quite strong in this sculpture, I think, because the down in Thomas Merkins is, and, and the Christ wound is, uh, is quite prominent. And even the little, you know, his arms are like this, it's a very slight proof of it. So form, isn't it? But equally there's nothing to say that it's not just a single one in my life either. You know, it's the subject matter, it was uh, the <coughs> evening, London's evening standard, where there are always, it's true, where there are often stories about stabbings, and um, uh, quite often the focus is on black children, and we just in America had this extraordinary, what's it called, the Zimmerman case, of a black and armed boy of 14 who's been shot by um, uh, a white American who um, said that he felt the boy was going to be getting up to mischief of some sort. And, uh, apparently said that he shot him in self-defense and has got away with the, um, uh, the crime. So the subject matter is, um, it is a subject matter which you encounter a lot in modern times. Knives, um, gangs, um, people just by chance losing their lives, and um, it, it's something you, you feel. If, if you, there are certain parts of Paris, if you um, walk around them, you feel a little bit under threat. Would you say that was fair? Charlie or Anthony. I think it's the one strike thing about the wall is the uncanny realism. Um, <coughs> Is he a religious person? Is he a religious person? What do you think, Charlie? I shouldn't have thought so. No, I, I, don't, I don't think he is. Not in a conventional, you know, ecclesiastical way, certainly. No. I would think that he exercises his mind with questions of religion, as we all do. But I'm quite sure that he doesn't go to uh, church or temple yeah. or chapel or mosque on Sundays. Um, but I think he thinks about those things. Um, just as people as they get older, he's 55 or so, tend to think more about those things. You mentioned the system, so I was wondering how many people typically get involved in making something like this. Um, um, yeah, there's um, 
I mean, generally he tries to do as much as possible on, in, on his own because he's such a stickler for the, the details. Mm -hmm. you know? It's very difficult to delegate things um, and then not find that he has to do them again if the assistants have gone home because they're not quite as, uh, as he saw them. But um, I, I think it's always a question of, of you know, of, to what point you, you can delegate things and, you know, and that don't require those artistic he makes all, obviously, all the artistic decisions himself and oversees everything very carefully. But clearly, you know, he doesn't cut down trees to make bits of wood and he doesn't weave the fabric himself to make the clothes. So you have to find a certain point. And that, that, um, so he's helped a lot by uh, usually two, perhaps three people in the, in the studio who are helping to mix plaster and, and you know, when they're making moulds, there's just a lot, you know, it's just a layer of stuff to be put on. There's, a, there's an awful lot of process involved. Um, but he's, in, he's involved in all the, some artists um, who make things, um, you know, sort of have a dirty workshop with, full of assistants with overalls covered in plaster. And, you know, they sit in a sort of quiet room, I'm sure you know, like this, I don't know what to do. You sit in a quiet room that's all clean, you know, where nobody covered in glass is allowed to go, and they dream up their ideas and, and you know, they're posted through the leather box in the studio. Um, but Ron's not like that at all. I mean, you know, he, he, if, if there's plaster to be mixed, he's mixed himself, unless he feels he's got something else to do, or there's just too much, and then somebody else can help or can do it for him. Um, and, and ideally for him, he, he would just be doing almost everything himself, but sometimes it's worth going to the sculptures at once, sometimes it's just too much to do it. He made all that hair himself, he's still finishing the wild man and he would have gone over anything, anything else. So it, typically two or three people are helping with, with processes like that at any one time. I remember with this sculpture, Ron went through an agony of getting <coughs> the precise colour of the boy's skin and talked about it for some time, didn't he? Seemed like weeks. Well, there were a million tests about how to just how to do it, not not just what colour, how dark, right. but how to actually make. I mean, everything else had made almost was pink before, and how to actually make dark flesh like that, because generally the colour is is cast into the sculpture, um, and there were thousands and thousands of tests to try and make that 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 colour. I think in the end, it's actually. This, it, it's actually coloured silicon that was sprayed onto the surface to make that brownness. We're showing a film um, on the landing across there, um, which was made by Gautier de Blonde, and it's a film of Rob working in the studio. So I'd really recommend you watch that. If you haven't got time tonight, come back and watch it because it's a really fantastic film. And there's no narrative or anything, it just really is observing him working. Um, and also some shots from the Cartier Foundation exhibition. Um, and we've also got in the photo gallery across the landing, um, we've got some examples of maquettes and some information about the working processes that you can look at too. There's some beautiful photographs of all the studios. They can give you an idea of it. 